We're here to check out this American Standard split system. We're going to check the blower amps, check the capacitor, then we can blow out the drain. Make sure the coil's clean by looking in this door here. Go ahead downstairs. We're going to check voltage on the unit. We have our two leads coming in here and here. We're going to check them down here on either side of the contactor. Make sure we don't have voltage. Our capacitor is mounted here. I'll take it off, check it as well. It is a 12.5, which I've switched a few years ago. Well, we're good to go. Check out the indoor coil. We can sort of get a glimmer of it right there. It's pretty clean. So that's a good thing. Checking the blower. I need to put the door back on. What I'm going to do is I'm going to fit it up sort of close so we get a better reading. We've got about one amp on this blower. Got about one amp, so not a perfect reading, but you know, it works for me. Here is our. I'm gonna blow that thing out. You see some debris starting to build up. We are outside of the unit. I'm checking each line to ground on the voltage. Something that, you know, all of us could probably work on. Sometimes we check it line to line, and it's not a true indication because I've actually seen, and I should know better, a situation where I got a two pole breaker sending me L1 and L1, so there was no voltage in between the two lines here, either side of the contactor but there was 120 volts to ground. So it did not look like it had any voltage, but if you had touched it, you would have definitely gotten shocked. So we're just checking that. We're gonna move on to check the capacitor, make sure it's okay. We have our leads there. The back one with the purple and red is the common terminal. We have it on the Herm on this side, and we're looking at 36.5. If we then move it over to the fan, I get the stick on there fan terminal right there we have 4.5 it's a 40 slash 5 it is deficient a little bit but not so much I think it needs to be replaced so we're gonna let it ride we're profiling the system now we're gonna be heat pump cooling standard TXV 13 sear system standard evaporator 2.5 tons as you can see we have our probes on low side adapter probe. The first one is for super heat. It goes over here on the suction line. The second one is for ambient temperature. I got it dangling up here. We have our high side probe. We have one monitor for liquid line temperature so we can have subcooling. So we have all those put in. We're ready to go. They're all turned on. As you can tell, you can tell from this board that we have a TXV because the system has been offline for several minutes and we still have quite a bit of a pressure differential. Uh, that'll happen when we have a TXV and orifice will equalize much more quickly. So we'll turn things on. We'll see how that TXV is doing. We have our 182 over 77. Pretty close to our targets. It says we're at three tons right now. That's a little erroneous. We have a nine degree split that's going to increase. I took airflow with a DAFM3. So after about 15 minutes, we're going to compare that with the estimation from the eye manifold. I like to give the system a few minutes before I check the compressor amps because that kind of builds up over a few minutes sometimes, especially in heat mode. Right now we're at 6.6 .6 out of 9.5, so we're good to go there. Our fan motor was 0.8 out of 0.9, so it's good as well. I'll just leave that meter on there for the duration of the service till we put things back together. We're gonna give the system a few more minutes to run before we make a call on the airflow. So we uh, want to make sure the system is stable. Now the iConnect has a stability indicator now, so we'll wait till it says it's stable, and then we'll see if it actually remains stable then. Right now it says it is not stable because the temperature split is still expanding, which is the case. So we're gonna wait and see what happens. We have been running for around 20, 25 minutes. We are stable as the indicator says. We have a 15.5 degree temperature split, 189 over 72.8. Both of those pretty close to the targets. 
So let's take a look. Our DAFM3 estimated the airflow around 800 CFM, which is a little bit shy on this system. It would be reasonable to believe that there's a little bit of duct leakage through the air handler filter door and probably a couple other areas around the grill, which the DAFM3 did not measure. But we're going to be generous and say that's between 50 and 100 CFM. So let's say we're between 850 and 900. We're now going to look at the performance as indicated by the iConnect. Our target temperature split is 17.2. Our temperature split is 15.7, so we're a little bit off of that. The iConnect has us at around 444 actual CFM per ton and a total of over 1,100 CFM, which puts us well beyond the estimate from the DAFM3. So the question is, which one of those is right and which one of them is wrong? Take a careful look at our tons estimate. We have a two and a half ton machine. We have been ranged an estimated capacity between 2.6 and 2.7. Pay attention to that. Our temperature split is still going up just slightly as we remove humidity from the air. So I guess the big question is, who wins iConnect versus the DAFM3 in calculating airflow? Well, it's kind of up in the air still. Here's why. We take the iConnect, it estimates via the indoor probes on the return and supply. Return and supply give you temperature, relative humidity, therefore you can calculate wet bulb and get enthalpy. And you have change in enthalpy. You take that to figure out the airflow. That's sort of what's still of a mystery to me. I'm working on how that you know, you get that, but they've worked out a method for doing that. The DAFM3 is a much simpler device. It uses a vane anemometer. Basically, it measures the air as it blows across a vane. You set in the square inches you're measuring. It takes in the air speed and it calculates how many cubic feet per minute. What I got was around 800. Logically, knowing that the air handler door leaks, they have a filter door on there, it's a loose fitting door, it's, it's not as tight as it could be. There's going to be a few leaks in the system around the grill, around the ceiling. So, it's going to be wrong. It's going to be wrong on the lower end. So, you should have more airflow than the DAFM3 sets. Okay. Let's say there's 50 to 100 more CFM. That gives us 850 to 90 for the 2.5 ton system. Okay, then we have our target temperature split, which is in the upper teens by the time we're done, between 16 and 17. We're off of that split to the lower end, so the iConnect says, okay, we have a smaller change in enthalpy, so naturally it says, well, that must mean we have more airflow because the air is not exposed to the coil for the same duration of time basically just thinking about it. If you're moving something very slowly across a hot surface, it's going to get hot. If you move very quickly, it's not going to get that hot. That's what it does. So iConnect says, okay, I think we have around 1100 CFM. So the DFM, DAFM3 says we have around 900 at the most, estimating. That's a big difference. So which one is right? Okay, let's go to the iConnect screen, we looked at the output tonnage. Output tonnage is calculated using the CFM, change in enthalpy, and the constant, 4.5. That's how I calculate it. So that's why I'm going to put it, I'm going to frame it like that. So it's dependent upon the CFM and a change in enthalpy. Okay, so we have a high CFM. And if that was the correct CFM, I would think that our output would be lower than 2.5 tons. Standard coil, standard regular unit, nothing special about it, not an oversized coil. So why are we putting out more capacity than the machine is capable of? Is it possible? I don't know. But what I was thinking to myself is what if the iConnect was wrong, overestimating airflow? that's going to push our capacity up beyond its normal threshold. So if we take the 900 CFM that we measured through the DAFM3 and then recalculate, we're going to have less than two and a half tons of capacity. Now we're nowhere near done with this and I'm not sold that either one of these devices is wrong. We just need to do more testing with it and compare more systems on a daily basis. That's what I, every time I can, I'm going to try to compare systems as far as different methods of measuring 
CFM. Now, in some of these methods, we probably had to do another equation to switch it from, you know, like static pressure from a standard CFM to an actual CFM. That's going to push it up a little bit, depending on the altitude and a couple other factors, the temperature of the air. And we're going to go over that equation as well, changing standard CFM into actual CFM. So that's from a later date. Got to get our uh, vapor pressure chart out. But we're going to dive into this as much as we can. I'm learning along with you guys. I know a little bit about it, but I'm going to continue to research so I can learn more. Valuable input from guys in the group will be necessary. Guys that have knowledge on this subject might be able to shed light on it and speed up the process. We can figure out what's going on. We can figure out which method is the best. And we can sort of iron out the details that you know are not coming in clear right now. So we're going to continue to do that, guys. I'm going to see you on the next one. Bam!